Welcome back. Hi, man. What's happening? Good to see you again. Good to see you. you Good got... to be back here in Vibeville. <laughs> <laughs> you got everything lined up. You got what do you got? Do you see your oh, phone? How many yeah, things? I quit smoking, but I still have a nicotine addiction. So All right. That's that. So that's I, that I don't know like, why I brought my phone. You chew in here. nicotine? Just, uh, no, you just these snus. It's a Scandinavian thing. You just suck on them. Okay. It's like chewing tobacco, except for. You don't spit all over the place. Okay. And then you have your phone, but you've uh, you very kindly turned it upside down so you can't see if someone calls you. Yeah. And I, I, I never <laughs> put the probably on anyway. So. vibrate or something. <laughs> um, it's, it's a good pleasure to see you again. Let me, let me get into this new record, Apocalyptic Love. Uh, so the last time you were on the show, I asked you why you didn't use just one singer mm -hmm. on your first solo record. You said it was because, and I'm quoting you, it would just be another record, just another band. Now, I'm assuming you don't believe this is just another band now. No, but I mean, I actually, on, on my last record, I must have said something about the fact that I wanted to do a project where I had all these different singers on my record as opposed to me going out and doing sessions on other people's records. Yes, and that you was, did. Okay. Right. Anyway, so that's what that was. And in the process, um, I met Miles and uh, asked him to do the tour I was putting together to support that record. And I just had this gut feeling that he was the one guy who could handle the diversity of all the material not only from the record but from guns and velvet and so on so and it turned out to be the case and so we put this band together with a couple of canadian guys brent fitz and todd kern yes and turned out to be this really great rock and roll band like i hadn't seen it come in well first of all this guy miles miles kennedy uh, uh, he's a he, a remarkable vocal he's, he's got yeah. a four octave range yeah uh, and you're, uh, it's not. He also, he's he's not a solely a technical singer. He's a really great lyricist and a great. Um, he's he's an emotional singer. Like he sings from the heart. So he's got all this range. So he goes all over the place because it's all coming from a good a certain place. You know. He co-wrote a, a bunch of this with you. This we we co-wrote the whole record. The whole record. Yeah. You've worked with some some of the most talented and versatile from in, in the business, right? Axl Rose and uh, uh, Scott Weiland. Does how does how does does Miles share some of the qualities that you saw in them? Um, well, I mean, really, I mean, there's not really any similarities. I don't think any of those three are particularly similar, to each similar. Other. yeah um, they all have a lot of charisma they all share uh, a certain charisma which is is probably the only attribute that they share different personalities entirely with miles um, he's you know I think a lot of it stems from the fact that originally he's a, was a guitar player and a guitar teacher and like that was his thing and then he went through what I went through we're going through all these bands trying to find somebody who could sing and never being able to sort of get that together I mean I, I couldn't find a singer until gun started um, so so he decided to sing himself you, so he's got a different personality than your average front guy you have such a signature sound like as soon as we hear something, it's uh, that slash. And partly because of that, and partly because of uh, people's appetite for it, it's it's usually at the forefront of the songs. Mm -hmm. Do do you um, change the way you play depending on who's singing, or do you are you just attracted to singers who work w well with your guitar style? That's a really, that's a good question. I, I would think that um, my style changes a little bit to to fit with the accompanying vocal. You know, so so I definitely I mean, I have a certain, you know, whatever that's me, but I think my approach um, alters a little bit depending on who I'm working with. So even on a record like this, when you guys are writing, you're listening to his voice and thinking what makes sense. Yeah, I, I mean, because a lot of a guitar for me is actually its own version of singing, you know, hmm. and so it has to interact with the person who's doing the actual verbal singing so it really influences the notes you pick in certain places nice I, you you mentioned um the canadians in the band canadian fans would recognize uh, your new bass the player. conspirators Todd, now affectionately to, called right <laughs> todd, todd kearns yeah. formerly front man of the canadian rock group age of electric in the 90s uh, what what has he brought to the table on this record um todd walked in and just was like the man i was like you know, the, yeah, you know, Brent Fitz introduced me to him. You know, they live in Vegas, and and I was looking for a bass player, and he goes, "I know a guy," and I really hardly took him seriously. You know, here's this guy I don't know telling me who he knows that's gonna. Right? And Todd drove down from Vegas, and he just fit in perfectly. And he's also on top of that, he's an amazing singer, but he's the only guy on the record that never had to stop because he made a mistake. <laughs> I swear to God, I did the whole record in one take. Really? Yeah. 
So, uh, like, um, do you do you, do you do different takes for each instrument, or, or no, no, with we, the bed tracks? We, he this just... record, what one of the cool things about this album is more so than any of the other ones that I've done. Um, I always play live with the band and keep the bass and drums. And okay. um, but I've always, because of headphones, the only way you can play live with the band is with headphones. And I never thought that I played very well with headphones. I definitely don't feel it when I'm wearing headphones. So I always go back and retract the guitars. And we, we built a room in the studio so that I could play with the guys and hear a playback from monitors as opposed to headphones. So the whole thing is live. Wow. So he, he was the only guy that we didn't have to stop punch the song. in anything or, or stop anything. We didn't have to stop the track because of a mistake like i've i made the band stop you know brent made the band stop miles uh, you know on occasion made the band stop and we'd have to start over because but never with todd and what is his reward for being so tediously perfect um, he, does well, he get something? Does he, he, get... He, he gets his own self-satisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> no, he good. knows that we all love him. But yeah. <laughs> um, musically, was did you have a goal? Was there something that you wanted to accomplish with Apocalyptic Love with this new with this record? Um, I just wanted to come up with a record that made everybody tongue-tied when they tried to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> Mission no, accomplished. Yeah, right. Um, uh, no, I think I wanted to make a full-blown you know, in your face rock record with that kind of energy. And these were the right guys to do it with. Um, a lot of how one makes records really depends on the chemistry between you and the other guys and how it all works. And that really sort of dictates what the whole finished product's gonna sound like. Mm. And so this was a particular band that we've been going at it hardcore from uh, March of 2010 until uh, the end of the summer of 2011. And it just had this great kind of energetic, heavy hitting vibe. So I wrote a bunch of material on the road and we just attacked it the same way we did the tour. I mean, the record is, it feels like pure rock, rock and roll. It's heavy riffs, dynamic lead vocals. You said that you don't think the songs on this album will get played on rock radio. Well, you know, it's a weird climate with, with rock rock radio. And it's like you might play stuff here, but I mean, universally around the world, it's it's... You know, the, the industry is really probably more pop oriented than it's ever been in my lifetime. Right. You know? What what has happened to rock? What, what, why? It's what? just been, um, you know, I mean, I don't want to, I think it's just been sort of kicked to the curb. I think a lot of it got softened up during, you know, sort of at the end of the 90s, heading into the millennium. And I think that rock bands sort of, a lot of young rock bands sort of forgot about the whole, the importance of where that interactive energy comes from and what really makes rock and roll work and the attitude and so on and so forth. But I think more than anything, um, it's just been the industry itself is just not taking any risks. They just want right. to prove, you know, tried and perfect pop song, especially because everything's gone corporate, you know, so... It's had a, a, a heavy duty effect on. So, but but there was corporate rock in the '80s too, right? Yeah, but I think more so now. I mean, I saw it happen from the mid '90s, mid to late '90s, and it just sort of, really sort of took over. I mean, obviously we don't have record stores because that's a whole internet kind of influence. But uh, you know, the few companies that are left, the few record companies that are left, are you know owned by conglomerates, and same with a lot of the radio stations. So. I think it's gotten, you know, exaggerated from where it was in the in the mid '80s. And why do you think? I mean, <clears throat> I, I, let me. There's a quote from you: "The more alienated rock becomes, the more I, I feel I really have to hold the flag. I know there's going to be a, a creative revolution where playing stuff from the heart is going to end up being more important than the cookie cutter commercial stuff." Wow, uh, that's a good quote. That's no, you. No, but I know. <laughs> but uh, I do. I feel you know. It's not even so much like when you say holding the flag. When I say that, well, you, I you mean, say that. When yeah. I say that, but I mean, I feel conscious of the fact that, you know, like I need to, I really need to focus completely on just that and make it even harder <laughs> and make it even edgier because I'm watching what's happening. It's making me rebel is what it is. Everything that's sort of going on in the, and the amount of attention that's being put on sort of lighter fare, so to speak. I mean, I don't mind it, but the fact that that's right. where everything is centered um, is making me go the exact opposite as, way. As a visible rock icon, do you feel then that you have to like bear some responsibility? Like the, it's important for you to hold the flag? I mean, do you feel pressure to take responsibility? No, no, I just feel like I should do what I do, <laughs> you know, but I feel r really driven to, to sort of focus it on 
you know, the harder aspect of, of what I do, you know, cause I've, I, I've played with a lot of different people and a lot of different genres and it's all good. But I, at this particular point in time, I feel like I really sort of need to, um, be one of the people spearheading the movement going the opposite direction. What, if you can put it into words, I don't know if you can, but uh, what, what do we lose, um, with the lack of respect or, 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 or lack of commercial attention that, that rock music gets? And, and has been getting, you're not the first to say this. I mean, there has been, you know, people talking about right. rock is dead or, or, or has been dismissed or has been dissed. Uh, you mm. know, what, what, what do we lose if there's a dearth of that? I know. I mean, rock and roll to me has always epitomized um, a certain kind of freedom of expression, a certain quality of anti-establishment and um, personal you know, sort of venting of whatever. And it was a certain energy and attitude to it. And I think that's really important. I don't think you get that much of an outlet in that way in what you call top 40. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can sing about dancing, you can sing about love, and you can sing about nothing too much, you know, hardcore, harder core than that. I mean, politics don't fit into that realm. And, and if you did have that outlet in hip hop, it's hip hop has now become top 40. It, well, yeah, so. exactly. Hip, hip hop has been as diluted as rock and roll was there for a second. So st st <clears throat> sticking with rock and roll, April 14th, Guns N' Roses will be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame alongside Red Hot Chili Peppers and Beastie Boys and Donovan, Donovan as well, to name a few. Well, what does it mean being inducted into the Rock Hall of Fame to you? Um, yeah, I've been asked that a lot, and and I mean it's it's obviously an honor. I know when I when I first heard that we were nominated, I, that was when I really felt the strongest about it. Um, but then when we got inducted, which is all great, you know, but there's a certain part of me that feels almost embarrassed because there's a slew, like an endless list of bands, worthy bands, that came. Uh, way before Guns N' Roses and were as, if not more so, influential than Guns N' Roses ever was that aren't uh, nominated and aren't inducted. So that gives it a sort of bittersweet kind of thing. And then also with all the sort of overblown animosity right. with myself and the You probably get asked band, about that a lot, right? You know, well, no, not, not anymore. But, um, but that sort of, you know, sort of takes the, the, the event out of it <laughs> you know but are you being generous about the the fact that there's other bands that deserve to be in there i mean you would think that you, you, do you believe you guys deserve to be in there yeah i mean i yeah. I, I, I feel that we do you know but then the, you know the other thing is who is the rock and roll hall of fame anyway <laughs> who, came, who said these guys could you know be the ones to dictate who gets in and who gets out and what establishment is yeah. that you know it's a, it certainly is rock and roll to not feel comfortable being inducted into a Hall of Fame right. of rock and roll. So, so I mean, I guess you know, I, it it doesn't it it it's it's I, either it hasn't sunk in or you know it just doesn't have the oomph to it that you you think it would. Huh. Uh, while I'm on the subject of, of who who's getting inducted, uh, GNR grew up alongside your fellow inductees, the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Right. You know, out of all the bands of that era. Uh, those guys have, have stuck it out and continue to thrive, you know, right. and continue to make records. Why do you think that is? I mean, uh, in, in, any insight into um, the, why I mean, the Chili I think Peppers have... I, I, I've known Flea for a long time, and I know Anthony a little bit. Um, I think those two seem to get along pretty well, you know. I mean, a lot of people have come in and out of that band since I went to high school with them. Um, they've had a handful of guitar players. They've gone through a couple drummers. Um, but as far as what makes that entity work, I'm not really sure. You'd have to ask them because, <laughs> you know, I'll ask them next time I see yeah, them. Yeah, so George yeah. wants to know. It's impressive, though, right? Yeah, yeah. It's great when any band I'm can Gian. survive. I'm Gian. Yeah. George is the Gian. other guy. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, sorry. It's okay. So, um, <laughs> uh, you know, any band that can survive uh, over, you know, 10 years of being sort of in each other's company yeah. and creating together, I think is, you know, deserves whatever honors or accolades they can get. You had a, um, uh, you, you experienced a reunion of sorts with when Velvet Revolver performed with, with singer Scott Weiland uh, to play a benefit show for, for the family of composer John O'Brien. Um, was having Scott join you again for, for that evening a positive experience? How was that? It wasn't a negative experience. Um, you know, we, we did the four songs. We got together at Soundcheck that day and sort of, you know, 
reacclimated, so to speak. And then we went and did did the four songs, and and it was uh, very polite and thank you very much, and you know, and so it wasn't a it wasn't like a, a there wasn't a, a major spark of like oh wow you know back slapping we're back <laughs> yeah we, there no. wasn't that right. but it but it went over it went over well and it was nice to see Scott and he was in good form since you know the last time I'd seen him and uh, and like that you know? and what what is the status of Velvet Revolver now? just. Uh, we still sort of beside, behind the scenes have this sort of singer quest going on. So every so often we have somebody come in and we do auditions and stuff like that. And then when, you know, whatever whatever comes to that, then everybody sort of takes off and goes into their, you know, their respective corners again and does their own thing until something else comes up and then we get back together. It must be, it's interesting being you because the longer you're making records in this business, you've got like this back catalog of, of bands that people are asking you about, right? Like, <laughs> what's the status of GNR? What's the status of Velvet Revolver? What's yeah. the status of your last project? We, I know, know the latest one has been, you know, so when's Snake Pit making another record? <laughs> right, right. Well, some of us <laughs> slash a Snake Pit. What, is, that, is, there, is that coming back? No, no. I, right, right, right now I'm just focused on the one thing. The album doesn't come out till May, so there's like a couple months of, of building up to that, and then the tour starts after. But it. you're a guy who likes putting yourself in a bunch of different situations, right? I mean, you say yes to playing with a band at the Super Bowl and, and appearing in a vi somebody's video and, do, and yeah. doing all that kind of stuff. Do you ever feel like you you do too much of that? Um, well, you know, it's like when when I'm focused on one thing, it's fine. Like what I what I'm just focused on the one thing. I don't sort of get out of the box. I sort of just stick to the tour and stick to. The, but when I'm off and things come up, you know, I sort of like to just jam here and jam there. And I'm not really sure whether that's a good thing or or not to anybody else. But for me, it keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> you <know>? Right, right. <laughs> you dig. It's it. like I like sort of adapting to these different environments and sort of seeing if I can handle this and seeing if I can handle that. Have you ever played with someone like a high profile gig? Um, and I mean, not wanting the main bands you played in, but uh, and kind of regretted it in retrospect. Kind of, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that gig. Um, Honestly, I mean, yeah. I mean, there, I'm not going to name any names, but there's been little things that I've gotten into where I was like, okay, you know, let's just get through this and get, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But all right, I won't make you name names. Uh, I mentioned earlier you, you started up this horror film production company called Slasher Films. Yeah. Why horror films? Well, that's always been my favorite genre of films. And ever since I was really, really little, um, and always has been. And I, I didn't actually aspire to become a film producer. I had a, I have a mutual friend who owns a production company that does a lot of horror movies and they do TV and all this other stuff. And when I say mutual friend, my wife and I, and so, he and I had this long conversation about horror films, which I know and ex I have an ex ex uh, extensive knowledge of right. horror films. And so he was really blown away at my whole take on what's lacking in modern horror films. Which is what? Well, I mean, they've just, they've, we've gotten to the point where um, on the average, I mean, there are some good ones that come out, but it's become a lot of slasher movies and it's be become, um, there's been a, a lack of, of, character development for one in most of the pictures that you'll go in and see it's just about how more or less how gross we can make you within an hour and a half right how quickly can we get to yeah and, it, and you know and then you start franchises based on that and it's just gotten to the point where i lost interest in sort of modern horror movies so you, you I, missed the great storylines of halloween and, well and i mean yeah <laughs> friday the 13th but halloween, actually the original one was really well made you know i mean even the first friday the 13th and they were exciting when they first came out but then they started you know, uh, redoing them to death, you know, and then they influenced a whole other level of dumbed down horror movies that sort of came out in the, in the wake of those movies. So with, with this, I had this conversation with Rob Eric, who's my partner, telling him my feelings on this. And he said, you should produce horror movies. There's some really great scripts out there that might not ever see the light of day. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so within a year, he produced a handful of scripts that were really good. So the first one that we've tackled um, goes into production next month. And it's called Nothing to Fear. And it's a great cast and great director and so on. So we'll see what happens. And then if that's really great, then I'll start talking a lot of crap about it. So, so <laughs> well, you'll reserve if talking it, the crap until then. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and so uh, when can we expect to see that? Or do you, do you... It's slated for next summer. Wow. 
That's exciting for yeah, you. Yeah, it's very exciting. It's a it's a, a creative outlet for me, which, you know, I mean, I'm involved with the entire process from script development to casting to the music and so on and so forth. But it's completely different than the actual sort of being in a band and doing all that. But it's something that I feel very passionate about. So. I mean, it seems like you you look healthy. It seems like you're in a good place. You got the the Hall of Fame honor, whether you love, depending on whether you love that or not. Uh, the new album, the new production company, uh, fruitful time to be slash. Do you I'm do, having do a you really, feel that way? I'm having a blast right now. Yeah. Yeah. You step back and okay, <clears throat> do, do you have do you have the ability to step back and look at your life and and no, I don't like to. <laughs> I actually I, I I like to stay in the now and one step ahead, but not too far ahead. So I don't really relish looking back on stuff and dwelling on past events or even too far in the future. It's just about what's now and what I'm doing tomorrow. You yeah. you stay in the present. Yeah. Good for you. It's good to see you, man. It's good to see you too. Thanks very much for this. Yeah, sorry I screwed the name up. Man. Congrats on the <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's interesting. There's two guys who come and visit here, so it's uh...